Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name's Peter Smallage. I'm the New York State Extension Forester. I work with, uh, I work at Cornell University. I work through the Cornell University Cooperative Extension System. So I have the great pleasure and honor of working uh, throughout New York State with private woodland owners and maple producers and foresters and other people who are interested in rural woodlands. And that interest and desire to uh, support goes beyond the the geographic boundaries of New York. So we often have about half of the participants in these webinars are from New York and the other half are from other states. So we usually hit about 16 or 17 states. So you're all welcome and um, I'm very pleased to be here. We're going to talk today about an introduction to the identification and ecology of northeastern conifers, native, common, and naturalized. So the point of this is really uh, to focus on the identification and it's the process of identification. So let's get started. Uh, first, I want to make some acknowledgments. Um, I use uh, draw very heavily on the photographs of other people. Oh, let me back up. Let me pause here. So for those of you who are watching this uh, right now as a live presentation, and I say that because they're, you know, this, we're recording this, if you want a printed copy, a hard copy of this, you can go to the file menu, the upper left-hand corner, go to save as, and select document, and then you want to change the file type to a PDF file type. Uh, that will give you this presentation as a PDF. There's no recording when you save it that way, but it'll give you um, all of the content that I'll be covering. And part of that content, as I move into these acknowledgments, are that there are several photographs that I've um, acquired through forestryimages.org. This is a kind of a public service, public accessible photo bank uh, related to, as you can imagine, forestry images. And uh, all of, you'll recognize all of those photographs because there's a code number in the bottom. And what, I sh what I'm supposed to do, and I haven't for many of these, is to, is to specifically recognize the author of those photographs. So my apologies, I, I will go back and change that in this presentation. But for, to, for today, know that many of these photographs are not mine, and I'm drawing uh, heavily from the assistance of many other people. Uh, most of the ecological information that I cover is available in what's called the Silvix Manual. So there's a great big long URL there. You see the second uh, na.fs.fed.us, so forth. If you just do an internet search for Silvix Manual, you'll will arrive at the correct destination. Uh, the Silvix Manual includes the silvical or life history characteristics of all of the trees that we'll be talking about today. There are a couple of good online sources uh, to know your trees. Uh, know Your Trees is a publication of Cornell Cooperative Extension. It's originally a 4-H publication, but it has very broad and good utilization for anybody interested in trees. And then one of the uh, best books for learning how to identify trees in the Northeast would be Trees of New York, Native and Naturalized by Dr. Don Leopold, who's a professor of uh, dendrology and department chair at the State University of New York in Syracuse, and I published that book through Syracuse University Press. So those were all great resources. What I'm hoping that you're going to accomplish here today is that um, you're, you're going to be able, in list form, to be able to list these learning identification skills and particularly the features of conifers that aid in identification. So we'll be covering those. I want you to be able to understand differences among conifers for particular habitats and ecological features. And then ideally, I hope that you can take five of the species that we cover and name two of their best recognizable features or BRFs. So I will give you those BRFs as we conclude. We'll talk about each species. I'll introduce it, work through its uh, particular ecological and identification features, and then summarize with the best recognizable features. So I'll give you those answers. I'm just hoping that you're going to be able to pick out the five that you like the best and then remember two things about each of those five. So. The, the process of learning how to identify trees, and this is what I refer to as the components of learning, um, 
uh, there are four points to that. First is to be able to match a description with what you see. And so I give two examples there, of venation and ranking of needles. But it's important you can read the words and you can say the words, but until you can form an image of in your mind that's associated with that uh, word, then you're not able to match up that descriptive with the visual. So that's an important part of what you need to do. That's what I'm going to try to do today is through pictures, uh, show you things, and then give you some of those key features. There's no way if you look up, uh, there's no way I'm going to be able to cover all of the different words and terminology that's associated with the taxonomy of plants. Um, and, and you'll get a feel for that if you open up any uh, botanical book and look at the glossary, the, the great variety of words that are available there. It's worth noting that some features vary more than other features. Um, this is more so the case in hardwoods than in conifers, so in deciduous trees more so than in conifers. Uh, but those features tend to vary where leaves tend to be the most variable, more variable than bark, which is uh, more variable than twigs, which is more variable than the fruit. And for conifers, the fruit, of course, is going to be a cone. You have to be able to manage terminology. Slightly different from the first point because there's just there's going to be a lot of words and it's easy to get bogged down in the great use of those words. And so use the and, and accumulate your familiarity with terminology as you go along. And then finally, learn how to use dichotomous keys. I'm going to be just uh, working you through kind of a series of 10 identifications. But the best way to learn to create the foundation that you want for learning is to have a systematic approach. And so if you use a dichotomous key, such as you can find in the Know Your Trees publication, uh, that, that, that orders your, your review of, of a specimen that you might be looking at and helps you think about where it is to fit in the bigger scheme of things. Um, it's it's much more difficult to approach it from a perspective of um, you know just memorizing all of the different different plants and then plucking from those. Mm. I thought oh I know what I did wrong hit the wrong button. So how do we learn trees? There's different features we want to think about. <clears throat> the first is the flowers. Uh, these tend to be relatively inaccessible, but that's how plants are classified. So when, when, you, when somebody says, I wonder why a rose and a cherry tree are in the same family, the reason is because of similarity in flower structure. Fruits uh, result from flowers. They're sometimes accessible, uh, so those are always a good, a good feature to pay attention to. Twigs are going to be more definitive in hardwoods and distinguishing in hardwoods than they are in conifers, but in conifers still they have some important features. Uh, the foliage conifers tends to be more consistent than in hardwood species, which tends to be very, quite variable. The bark for some species is diagnostic. Um, it seems to be, I think it's uh, easier to differentiate hardwoods based on bark than conifers, but there are certainly differences in the bark between all of the conifers. Crown architecture sometimes works. Habitat will sometimes work uh, within a genus, so it may be that you know that it's a pine tree or it's a spruce tree, and you will be able to, based on habitat, surmise that it's a particular species given the habitat where it occurs. And then to a limited extent, shade tolerance will maybe help us narrow the field, narrow the range of options if we're looking at uh, understory seedlings. Because if some species are growing in the shade and seem to be surviving in the shade, that will exclude species that are intolerant of shade. Um, we can also think about, or another um, way, another uh, element of identifying uh, conifers and plants in general is their taxonomy. And so every plant can uh, be configured hierarchically as you see here. So we, we work within the kingdom of plants and then the sub-kingdom of vascular plants. And you can see all the way down through and at the very bottom we have an individual species. 
And so we know that a species in this example is eastern white pine is within the genus Pinus. And so from that, we would know that there would be other species within the genus Pinus and that they would have greater similarity within the genus than between genera. So there are, and I will often be referring to characteristics of a genus and say this is a generic uh, feature or a feature of this uh, genus uh, pine versus the genus uh, suga for hemlock, for example. Um, so this is just a, a way to, to frame the hierarchy of, of organizing biological organisms. Uh, we'll be talking about two, I think, two different families, the pine family and the cedar family, which is Cupressaceae. Okay, so there are some distinct advantages or, or disadvantage, advantages and disadvantages of being conifer. One of the, the benefits of evergreen foliage is that it's it's only produced once, and so you may so a conifer plant expends some amount of energy to produce foliage. In in the case of conifers, it tends to be needles, um, and and so um, that that one time expense is utilized over two or sometimes three or even more growing seasons. So it has greater efficiency. The conifers are thought to have a more efficient use of resources as they develop this foliage. And because of that, it allows them to survive in soils that may be uh, less fertile and less hospitable, uh, more demanding sites than what many of the hardwoods can survive on. Uh, the risk to that, of course, is that you have foliage always available, and, and when that foliage is always available, then pests are able to attack that and uh, have access to that. And a good example of that is the hemlock woolly adelgid. The adelgid um, attaches to foliage, and for the life of the adelgid, it stays on that one needle. So if hemlock dropped its needles every year, dropped its foliage every year, that insect pest uh, would need to have some mechanism to reinfest the tree in each case. Um, the seeds are described as, in this, this group of conifers is called gymnosperms or naked seeds. The seeds are exposed in cones and the cones have uh, scales or, uh, and the scales are are variously described as modifications of foliage or modifications of twigs. Those seeds are typically exposed and apparent. That's why they're called the naked seeds. <clears throat> Conifers tend to be limited to, uh, or, or I don't want to say limited to, conifers tend to be successful on nutrient limited sites. So they might have low organic matter, poorly drained or acidic soils as, as exceptions. They can also grow on high fertility sites, uh, but oftentimes hardwoods tend to outcompete them. Many of the conifers are also quite adept at um, colonizing and surviving recently disturbed soils. The utilization of conifers is quite intriguing, and many of you will be familiar with the historic role that white pine played in the history of America. Uh, back in the colonial period, the King of England um, learned of the great forests of the Northeast and the accessibility of eastern white pine trees that were several feet thick and um, scores of feet tall and straight and the potential utility of these to use them as ship masts. And so the originally the, the King of England, as I've read, uh, reserved all pine trees greater than, let's say, 12 inches in diameter. I think that was the threshold uh, for use by the king and that and that if you owned that land, even though the trees were on your land, those trees belonged to the king. This was known as the broad arrow policy. And and people were sent over and and would blaze a broad arrow uh, into the into the stem of the conifers and reserving those for the king. That, as you can imagine, created some angst amongst the people that owned the land who wanted to be able to use that timber for other purposes. 
Uh, another historic utilization of conifers is in the tanning industry, the leather tanning industry, where the bark of hemlock trees was peeled from the hemlocks. And there are reports from decades ago about uh, large collections of hemlock stems uh, peeled of their bark uh, line in piles, so that the only the only value of the hemlock that was viewed was the was the accessibility of the bark for tanning purposes. Um, historically and currently, uh, we have uh, utilization of conifers for pulp and paper uh, for building materials. You can see the wooden barn structure built here. Uh, for wildlife habitat, conifers create. Uh, potentially very unique habitat condition, and also for what are called naval stores or turpentines uh, were collected and still are collected from conifers. So conifers are very important from a utilization perspective. Uh, they're aesthetically pleasing on the landscape. There's something very special about seeing conifers. Uh, in a, uh, they can warm your heart on a cold winter day just to know that there's something green in the forest, even though it might be five degrees outside. As, um, as I describe these plants, I'm going to be talking about the foliage. In all cases, the fruit in all cases. Uh, typically, I'll make some mention of bark. Uh, I'll show you pictures of bark. I may or may not have anything noteworthy to say about bark. For some species, it's diagnostic. For other species, it is not. And then oftentimes, there are, there are features of the growth form or the habit of the tree, either at the branch level or the tree level, that are noteworthy. I was curious about cones, and I was thinking about trying to learn more about cones. And I just, for those of you that are interested, there's a very nice uh, discussion of cones that we see uh, on the screen. Let me see if I can find. Um, no, that's not going to work. Let's see if I can. I can't highlight it. So, um, but if you save a save a copy of this presentation, you'll be able to link to it. But it's very, you know, it's interesting. It talks about um, male cones versus female cones, and the, the male cones is really a misnomer, and that parts of a cone. So it's it's worth if you're if this is a subject you're interested in, it's worth taking a look at that. Okay, so let's jump into our first species. We'll start with the king of the forest, and one of my favorite conifers is the eastern white pine, Pinus strobus, and the defining feature of the genus. Pinus is that its needles are born, B-O-R-N-E, or originate in a cluster. And you can see in the picture on the left this cluster of needles, and that cluster is called a fascicle. So that's a little bit of terminology for you. Uh, white pine is uh, in, in the pine, the genus Pinus is broken into hard pines and soft pines. Uh, Eastern white pine is the one representative of a soft pine that occurs in the northeastern United States. Uh, when you get into the western United States, you have western white pine, you have sugar pine, and you have limber pine that are all examples of the soft pines. Uh, for eastern white pine, one of the distinguishing features is that it has five needles in its fascicle. And you can see that on the left. One, two, three, four, five needles are apparent in that fascicle. So you can count those needles. You can also see that in the picture on the right where uh, you can see some of those needles are clustered. So if you're looking at a conifer and you see that the needles are clustered and they have a maximum of five needles, that's the maximum that you'll find anywhere that I'm aware of, then you know it's going to be in the genus Pinus. We'll look at an example of what appears to be clustered foliage later when we get into the tamarack group. So five needles for eastern white pine. The way to remember that is that there's five letters in the word white, and there's five needles in the fascicle. And that's a very good mnemonic, except that it doesn't work for any of the others. So if we think about red pine, it does not have three needles, as the word R-E-D has three letters. But that, that mnemonic works for white pine. Uh, part of the reason why it's called white pine is because, as you see in the picture on the right, there's a whitish cast to the foliage. And that whitish cast is associated with uh, uh, 
a specialized cell that occurs on one side of that needle. That specialized cell is called a stomate, and the stomate allows for gas exchange. So it allows for the release of oxygen and the uptake of carbon dioxide. And what's special about the stomate is, and the reasons why it is white, is because there's a waxy band around it. So the, the stomate is an opening, and the cells that guard that opening are the, called the guard cells, and they have a special, special waxy coating that limits the loss of moisture from that needle. You can imagine if you have a needle that's exposed 20, uh, 12 months out of the year, that you'll have uh, greater opportunities for desiccation or drying out. Uh, so that there are special cell structures that allow for retention of moisture, and those special structures give a whitish overall cast to the, um, to the plant. So eastern white pine, five needles in the fascicle, and it's called white pine because of the whitish cast associated with the needles when you look at the branch in aggregate. Uh, some other features. I have to see where I am here. Uh, other features are the uh, uh, the ability of the plant. It, it has a, and this isn't a good picture. Let me move on to the next one. This is, shows it a little bit better. Uh, it shows a very soft texture to the crown is one thing. So you can see, especially on the picture on the left, the foliage has a soft look to it. In fact, if you grabbed a branch close to the stem and then just gently pulled your hand along the branch towards the outside edge of that branch, the distal end of that branch, you would have a very soft feel to it. There are other conifers that don't do that. Um, a feature, though, that I uh, wanted to emphasize here is the is the presence of growth whorls. So we have a whorl of branches, and whorl is spelled W-H-O-R-L. Uh, there's one whorl, there's another whorl, and there's another whorl. And what happens is every year, the plant, when the top of the plant breaks bud, it sends uh, one bud develops a stem that goes vertical, and the other buds uh, develop into stems that go horizontally. And you can gauge the um, you can you can gauge the the growth rate of a plant based on the extent of growth from one world to the next. So you can you can count backwards from the top of the tree, and you can say, okay, this growth whorl, as I've outlined here in turquoise, uh, that was the growth whorl from. You know, whatever year it might have been, 2011, and you can say the height growth in 2011 was was such and such, and it compares to 2010, which precedes it, and 2012 that follows it. So you can you can you can retroactively create growing conditions, and there's a lot of things that affect growing conditions: sunlight, soil moisture, and what have you. So the growth whorls are an important feature of red pine that also occur on some other pines. So this is not a feature that's that's diagnostic for eastern white pine. Here's a picture of the bark, and I'll show you some young bark here in a minute, but the older bark is kind of a grayish black. The cone is the longest of all of the pine cones. It tends to be at least four, maybe upwards of six inches in length. Uh, it's interesting when you go into the western United States, the western white pine cones are even longer, and then sugar pine cones can be uh, 20 inches or more in size. What I'd like you to focus on is not only the size, uh, but notice just in general the number of scales that you see on that cone. So those those scales are like if you think about the scales on a fish, those scales on a cone, you can see them. They're kind of rounded on the edges. And if you did a quick look, you would say, okay, there's maybe 12 or 16 or 18 scales that I can see. This is going to be in contrast to one of the other species that we look at in a few minutes, Norway spruce, which has a cone about the same size but has uh, more numerous scales. The other thing to point out is with all of the pine cones, the scales remain attached to the central stalk. Um, 
on white pine as the when the cone matures the scales open up that's not the case for all of the cones as we'll see in just a moment so in the landscape uh, white pine the picture on the left the eastern white pine has a stately appearance uh, it's just aesthetically very appealing. A picture on the right shows a more mature, heavy bark, uh, and that bark can be uh, an inch to an inch and a half, maybe two inches thick on some very large trees. One of the problems that that white pine suffers is from the white pine weevil. This is an insect that bores uh, into, there's the uh, probably the exit hole for the larvae. So the adult white pine weevil will lay its eggs on the central leader or that, that most recently produced vertical stem. The larvae get inside that stem and uh, as you can see here in the next picture moving from left to right, those larvae will um, excavate the inside of that stem uh, that disrupts the flow of nutrients, the foliage dies, and then do you remember the whirl of branches, those lateral branches take over and try to attain uh, vertical dominance. So there's what's called a negative geotropism in conifers. It's this negative sense, or it's negative in the sense that it's growing away from the earth. So the tendency is to grow away from the earth, uh, and so it forces those lateral branches to take over, and you might have... <clears throat> Here you can see two branches that were fairly successful and then two branches in the middle that were fairly unsuccessful in attaining dominance. And then eventually, because of the eastern white, uh, because of the white pine weevil, you have trees that have uh, a form that is degraded because you lost, you lose that central tendency. If you remember a few pictures back, those trees that were growing on the lawn had very straight central stems. Uh, if you're interested in lumber from a tree and having this multiple branching pattern is a distinct disadvantage. So Joanne says, what can be done about that? We lost a bunch of trees. Um, so the, the two ways to manage this are uh, the white pine weevil does best in full sunlight conditions. So if you have white pine trees and you're planting them in your yard, chances are you're going to lose the terminal leader to the white pine weevil. And, and uh, the, so then those, the, the lateral branches take over as terminal leaders and the white pine weevil comes back and attacks those as well. So just, it's not a, it's not a one time and then you're clear problem every time you have these plants growing in full sunlight. So if you're, if you're trying to grow eastern white pine, um, in the sunlight, you should expect this, and uh, what you will attain as a result of that are what are called cabbage pines. So it's not a type of pine, it's just a white pine that has been repeatedly uh, hit by the white pine weevil, and so instead of maintaining a strong central stem, there's this annual uh, dieback of the central stems, and then uh, the reassertion of dominance by lateral stems until you essentially have a bush. So you can use that to your advantage if you want to create a hedge, an evergreen coniferous hedge. You can plant white pine uh, in a row and let the weevil do its work and you will have a hedge of white pine that's maintained by the white pine weevil. If what you want are tall stately trees, you need to have, um, well, I don't know how, I don't know if there's a way you can do it in full sunlight with eastern white pine. Uh, if you have, so when we try to regenerate white pine uh, in, in natural settings, what we'll do is we'll use, uh, we'll maintain some shade or we'll retain, you know, some of the previous um, cohort of adult plants as shade as we're trying to regenerate the next uh, cohort uh, of regeneration. So there's a, there are big trees in the area uh, that, that create, they cast the seed, but then they also create shade as those younger plants are growing up. The white pine weevil, and I'm not sure if the weevil is drawn to full sunlight or if it's drawn to a stem that is large and succulent because it is growing in full sunlight, if you see that distinction. So it, um, but so the so partial shading is is one strategy to help 
reduce the, the effects, the reduce the incidence of white pine weevil. Uh, by, by growing lots of seedlings per acre, it provides the opportunity if you are uh, experiencing some white pine weevil loss that you can cut the trees that have been damaged uh, and you have other trees left behind that can survive to form the next forest. Okay, moving on. So the best recognizable features for white pine are that it has a five needle pine without a fascicle sheath. So that's the fascicle, this is this stated here. The fascicle is the cluster and what I neglected to describe, let me go back to that quickly. What I neglected to describe was at the base of the fascicle, on all of the pines, as those needles emerge, there's, uh, you've all seen onion skin, right? So it's very thin, papery texture. There's a narrow band of, of, of um, like onion skin, but it's not onion skin because it's a pine. We'll call it a pine skin if you want, but it's really just a thin layer of, 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 plant tissue that encloses the base of the fascicle and so the needles emerge from that fascicle sheath. In eastern white pine that fascicle sheath is deciduous so you don't see it in this picture because it's gone. Um, that's one of the either confusing or comical things about plant identification is sometimes we talk about what you can't see. So what you can't see here is the fascicle sheath because the fascicle sheath is deciduous. So that's a feature. It has the longest cone of the eastern white pines and very soft textured branches. Um, it's very widespread. Uh, it often grows on well-drained soils. Uh, in my woodlot, I have very deep sandy soils and it grows quite well there and it can grow as well on moisture soils. So the one that uh, that is a nice comparison to this is red pine. And so you can see uh, red pine uh, here. On the right, you will notice, let me point that out, you see the bundle that grips that fascicle. And you can see just kind of it's like a whitish papery coating at the base of that needle. Let me move my pointer so that you can see it. That's the fascicle sheath. On red pine, the fascicle sheath is persistent. In eastern white pine, it is deciduous. The other thing that you can see with red pine is that it has two needles in the fascicle versus five needles in the fascicle for eastern white pine. You can also see that the twigs, I'm sorry, the, the needles are much stouter. And I was looking at this picture earlier and just trying to think about how to, you know, mentally arrange that. And I don't, I can't verify this, but I would. I'll suggest that if you look at the, you know, the total weight of the fascicle is going to be about the same for a red pine versus a white pine. So if you just did, you know, a volume analysis or a weight analysis, the difference though with the white pine, that weight is distributed amongst five needles in the red pine, the weight of the volume is distributed amongst two needles. So the, the needles on red pine are bigger and more, more robust. We'll see in a moment that they have, that they don't have the soft looking texture that eastern white pine does. Uh, with with red pine, if you take the needles, uh, if you grab that fascicle uh, and you put uh, your thumb and forefinger on one end of the fascicle and then your other hand, thumb and forefinger at the other end of the fascicle and then you pushed your thumbs and forefingers together so essentially you were forming an arc of that needle. As it bent, it would eventually break and when it breaks, it would break cleanly so you would have a portion of the needle the fascicle in one hand and then the other fat the other portion in the other hand. This distinguishes red pine from black pine, which is Pinus nigra, and Pinus nigra has about has foliage that looks very similar to eastern or to red pine. Uh, but one difference is that the needles do not break cleanly. So that's an important feature. Here's what the foliage of red pine looks like. In silhouette, you can see that it, although it's still soft because it's a pine, it, in my mind it looks more like a stovepipe brush than it does the soft texture of eastern white pine. 
Here are the cones. You can see the cones on the ground are much smaller than the pocket knife. The pocket knife is a point of reference. You'll remember in eastern white pine, the, the cone was bigger than the pocket knife. Here, the pocket knife is bigger than two cones together. So they tend to be much smaller. I think of them about the size of a golf ball. Uh, and then the picture on the right is a red pine cone that has opened up. And it's not evident in the picture, but the underneath side of the scale, and that would be the, the um, I think that's the ventral side, the side away towards the distal end. Uh, that's where you would find the seeds. And, and within each scale, you're typically going to find two seeds. Here's the bark of red pine. It's, this is why it's called red pine, because it has a reddish or a cinnamon cast to the bark. Uh, the bark of these mature trees tends to be platy, kind of a combination of platy and ridgy. Um, and the trees have an, an as described as an oval shape to the crown. Right? So if you have these trees growing in a fairly open condition, that's the shape of the crown. The picture on the left is a plantation. There are thousands, if not millions, of acres of red pine plantation, especially in the lake states. So uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota is, is a commonly planted species. It was commonly planted in the Northeast uh, in the uh, 1930s and 1940s as there were efforts made to revegetate abandoned agricultural lands. Here's a look of eastern red pine on the left. I'm sorry, red pine on the left and eastern white pine on the right. So these are these are stems that are about 50 years old. This is in my wood lot. And you can see the still rather smooth bark of the eastern white pine. You can also see the evidence for the whorls on eastern red pine and the evidence for whorls on, I'm getting those words mixed up, I apologize. You can see evidence for whorls on both species. How's that? And again, you can use that to judge uh, the growth rate of the tree. You can also age the tree. Um, so you can count, you know, these are trees that are 50 years old. And if you had binoculars and a good pair of eyes, you could count down and get a pretty good sense of how old that tree was simply by counting the branch whorls. Best recognizable features for red pine, Pinus resinosa, two needles. They're brittle, meaning that when you pinch them and bend them together, the needles break. Uh, it's a cinnamon red bark. The branches look like a bristle brush or a, a stovepipe brush, and they tend to have a symmetrical oval crown when grown in the open. Another native pine is jack pine, Pinus banksiana. And it's also referred, some people refer to this as gray pine. Um, you can see at the base of that fascicle, there's, in this picture, it's kind of a reddish color. So that fascicle sheath is persistent. What's diagnostic about the foliage of jack pine is that there are two needles, just like red pine had two needles in a fascicle. But these needles are quite short. So they're less than an inch in length, and they are divergent. So you see the way they spread. Um, let me scroll back to our, so here's our red pine and our white pine foliage. You see that they are much longer, and you see that they are not necessarily um, divergent. So here the jack pine is very much a divergent. Uh, so they're spread. The, the two needles flare apart. Uh, jack pine is unique in that it has cones that are persistent, so the cones persist on the stem. The other pines that we have in the Northeast do not do that. And the cones are serotonous, so those are two attributes. Uh, one is persistent, they remain in the, on the stem, and serotonous means that the cones remain closed, almost uh, enclosed and encased in a waxy-like substance, and that that serotony is maintained until the pine cones heat up. Uh, so this is a species that is uh, common on areas or that can survive on areas and reproduce on areas where there are fires. And indeed, many 
uh, times the regeneration methods to regenerate jack pine include discussions of controlled or prescribed burning in order to uh, open the cones and allow them to for the seeds to disperse. You can imagine the advantage of a cone being dispersed after a fire where the understory has been burned away, where the leaf litter has been burned away, and what you have left exposed is mineral soil, which provides a good seed bed for jack pine. Uh, jack pine is a species that is um, associated with the, and I may get this wrong, somebody that's a birder will correct me, Kirkland, Kirkland, Kirkland warbler in the Lake States, and there was a great controversy some decades ago about uh, burning jack pine forests in order to create habitat for the Kirkland warbler, and those fires got out of hand, and there was some um, at least loss of, of homes. Uh, I don't know if it was more extensive than that uh, in, in areas surrounding this prescribed burn. So jack pine management sometimes includes it. It's not known for particular value as in, in lumber utilization. It tends to be kind of a scraggly tree. It's very important ecologically because it can occupy very severe sites, as you can see portrayed in this picture. So the best recognizable features, two needles, divergent straight needles, and that's going to be important when we look at the next species, grows on dry soils, it has persistent um, serotonous cones, and I also neglected to say the cones are sessile, which means the cone does not have a stalk, the cone attaches directly to the branch. Uh, more common in the Lake States and Central Canadian provinces, it does occur in spotty locations in New England. In New York, for example, I think there's a couple of sand plain areas where we have jack pine. All right. The next species is scotch pine. So this is a non-native species. Uh, I don't know if it's considered invasive. It will naturalize, so there are lots of acres of scotch pine that have been planted in an effort to reforest uh, abandoned agricultural lands or to create coniferous cover. Uh, when I, I grew up in the Midwest and this was the most common Christmas tree. I don't know if that's still the case or not. So what we're looking at here for diagnostics is that this also has two needles and you're getting the sense here that the pine trees in the northeast are either two needle or five needle. If it's a five needle, it's easy. It's it's uh, eastern white pine. If it's a four needle, it's also easy. It's an eastern white pine that's lost one of the needles from the fascicle. There are no four needle pines. Um, a three needle pine, we're not going to look at. The example of that would be pitch pine, Pinus rigida. The way you remember three needles is that pitch. There are three pitches. Three strikes, you're out. So it's kind of a baseball analogy. But we're just looking at two needle and five needle. This scotch pine is a two needle. The difference with scotch pine, the difference between scotch pine and jack pine, the needles on scotch pine are longer. You see them here being closer to an inch and a half. It's a hard pine, so the fascicle sheath is persistent. You can see that fascicle sheath um, here at the end of the needles. The difference, though, is if you look at either of those two needles, you can see it most clearly on the upper needle. It looks like the needle, although they're slightly divergent, it looks like the needles have been twisted. So if you grabbed, like if you're going to make a candy cane, the swirl in a candy cane, you grab each end of the needle, uh, one end in each hand, and you rotate your hands in different directions, and so you get a twisting of that needle. That is diagnostic for Scotch pine, Pinus sylvestris. Here you can see the foliage is indeed longer, uh, and it's semi-divergent. It's not always divergent, but it tends to be fairly divergent, and um, you know it's 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 a widely planted tree. I think we have I have a picture. Uh, here are the cones. Uh, cones look a little bit similar to red pine, similar in shape, but distinctly different. One of the things that we don't have, so here's another way we're talking about what, what you're not seeing on this picture. What we don't have in our northeastern pines 
on the end, so that kind of the blunt end of that scale is called the umbo, U-M-B-O. Uh, in southern pines, some of the southern pines and some of the western pines, the umbo is armed. So it would be described as an armed umbo or an unarmed umbo. And that umbo is a spine or a pricker. And you can see what might be, you know, kind of the vestigial presence of the arming here when you look at the tip ends of, of some of the scotch pines. But none of none of the well, I take that back. So uh pitch pine may have an armed umbo and Virginia pine, both of which can occur in New York, may also have an armed umbo. But the majority of our pines lack that armed umbo. Uh, what you will often see along the roadside are these trees. Scotch pines that have a bright orange inner bark, and that's absolutely diagnostic for scotch pine. Uh, many of the scotch pines were planted. They came from a seed source in southern Europe, and those trees were genetically prone to growing to not growing straight, so they grow with a crooked stem. So scotch pine early on uh, obtained a bad reputation as having no value for lumber. Um, and I don't know if it has much value for lumber to begin with. Ecologically, it's similar uh, to jack pine in that it tends to occur naturally on, on poor, uh, poor fertility soils. Some of them told that some of the northern varieties of Scotch pine or varieties, seed sources from northern Europe had much better form. So, best recognizable features uh, paired needles, twisted orange flaky bark in the upper stem, variable stem quality. Um, okay. Eastern hemlock. So now we have a new genus. Right, Our genus up to this point has been Pinus. Here the genus is Suga canadensis. Genus is Suga, the species is canadensis, Canadian or Canada hemlock, eastern hemlock. So a couple of things to note. The foliage here is diagnostic and useful. So you'll see that the foliage is what's called two-ranked. So the foliage is attached to the stem, but it extends laterally to the, essentially to the left or to the right. Two ranked is like wings on an airplane are two ranked. So that foliage extends in two different directions and planes. Um, I think you can zoom your screen in. And if you want to do that, zoom in on the picture on the left. And you will see as you look along the stem, you will see small needles, and I'm circling some of these. And by small, I mean they're one third the size of the other needles. And those needles are attached to the top edge of the twig. And often, they are, as they attach, they invert. So the needle, you're looking at the top side of the twig, but as the needles those small needles on that top plane are rolled so they show the underneath side of the needle. Uh, so that's a diagnostic feature of genus. So there's another species, uh, Suga caroliniana, that I believe does the same thing. Uh, the underneath side of the needles you see on the right-hand side of the picture has two white bands, and those white bands are, as we described previously, those are those are white bands of stomatal cells, so two white bands. Oh, so here's a close-up. I'm trying to do a close-up picture of those small needles that are attached to the upper surface of the twig. The cones, I think, are very attractive. They look like tiny little dwarf-sized cones. You see those on the left, um, about the size of a small marble. So if you're trying to get an idea of what size those are, you can you can see the thumb in the picture. Uh, another interesting feature when you do a cutaway cross section of the bark, you see that there are between the layers of bark, and I'm drawing trying to draw that line. Um, I shouldn't because then you can't see it. Uh, there are purple striations. So you see those purple lines running. Uh, so you can imagine how the bark is made up of layers. 
And between each of those layers, there's these purple striations. Uh, and that's evident. You know, for a long time, I was doing some woodworking over the weekend, and I had some hemlock boards, and I was planing them, and I had some wane on one edge of the board, and as it was planing away, I was getting these purple streaks that were remaining in the bark. Uh, here you see the smaller, a uh, younger tree on the left, and then a more mature tree on the right. So the bark you see on the right looks an awful lot like eastern white pine. One of the differences is that hemlock tends to be very tolerant of shade, unlike eastern white pine. And so the bark may look similar. Eastern uh, hemlock will retain its branches. Eastern white pine will not retain its branches. So if you have the branches are retained, I mean the branches, you know, the needles are very different there. You know, the needles may be three quarters of an inch long on hemlock and they may be uh, two and a half or three inches on eastern white pine, but just the presence of low branches uh, that are retained would suggest that it has to be a shade tolerant species. Uh, it can grow very well in shade and it can be regenerated in small patches or small openings, as we see here. So the best recognizable features, it's two-ranked singular foliage with inverted upper twig needles. That's what I was describing, where those small needles on the upper side are inverted. Uh, the purple striations occur within the bark, and then the branches persist. Uh, so it's the most tolerant, shade tolerant of all of our conifers, it's capable of very slow growth. Uh, you can find stems that are three or four inches in diameter, and if you cut them and cross-section them or core them, you may find that they are many decades old. Um, another interesting feature, and I don't have a picture of it, but the, the terminal leader on hemlock, and you can see this on even on mature trees, but certainly you see it on younger trees. The terminal leader um, you know, on the pines, the terminal leader remains erect. The terminal leader on eastern hemlock, the tip of that will droop over. So it almost looks like a shepherd's crook as it as it tips over. Now I don't know how in next year when it's ready for that new leader to elongate. I don't know. It must be that that drooping is overcome, uh, maybe through the hormones of negative geotropism. All right, I need to go faster. We have eight minutes. All of the spruces have a feature known as sterigmata. The sterigmata are the peg-like projections that you see on this branch. So this is the dead branch, and I use it to illustrate most clearly these sterigmata. All of the spruce have sterigmata. That's where the needles are attached. Um, one of my favorite spruces, when I wrote a lot of, uh, did some research on for my PhD, was red spruce, Picea rubens. Uh, you can see the foliage here is a very dark green, lustrous looking foliage. Uh, very, I think a very attractive tree. Needles are born singularly on a steric matter. That's the case for all of the spruces. Uh, here's a look at the cone. Now notice the spruces, look at the number of scales on that spruce cone. That spruce cone is an inch and a half or an inch and three quarter long, and it has as many scales as that eastern white pine cone had. So there's a much higher density of cone of scales on the cones of the spruces than we find on the pines. Uh, red spruce is shade tolerant, not to the same extent that that hemlock is, but it is still nonetheless a very shade tolerant species. Here you can see these two growing together, hemlock in the understory, red spruce in the overstory. A beautiful tree, an important timber species in uh, some, you know, some states like Maine, red spruce is an important timber species. Uh, it's the lumber that historically was used to make violins because of the resonance of the wood, the sound quality of the wood. Uh, you can also find it growing mixed in sometimes with black spruce on very exposed, low-quality sites. Here you have 
uh, mostly rock, and you have a little bit of soil that accumulates in the crevices or in the depressions of the rock. So red spruce can occur in these kinds of habitats. And people have done ecological work looking at essentially four ecozones where you might find red spruce growing. So this would be a different ecozone where there's actually dirt. The best recognizable feature is that it's the second smallest of the spruce cones. Black spruce, we'll see in a moment, has the smallest, and it's the most common spruce within its range, and that range is from the maritime provinces throughout New England, the Adirondacks, and down into the Carolinas. Black spruce, uh, very similar in many respects to, um, uh, to red spruce. Uh, the difference is the cone is smaller, and let me see if I have a picture of the cone here in a minute. Well, the cone, uh, if I don't mention it, the edge, the margin of the scale, so you, see, you know what the scale is, is that platey looking structure. The margin of that scale, the word is erose, E R O S E, which means jagged or torn. So the margin of the scale on black spruce is erose, the margin of the scale on red spruce is is entire, which means it's smooth. Black spruce can grow in swampy conditions. It's considered a pioneer species on sphagnum bogs, and it can grow extremely slowly. It's considered uh, relatively intolerant of shade, uh, and it will grow on these very poor, nutrient poor, soil poor uh, site conditions. Best recognizable features, uh, smallest of the cones, it's common in bogs and organic soils. Um, with tamarack, it can uh, define the northern limit of tree growth. So when you're, when you're at the kind of edge of the vegetated world and you're running out of trees as you keep going north, so some of the last trees that you'll see will be Picea mariana. It does have the ability to reproduce itself by layering, so as those branches, lower branches, drop down into the moist moss, uh, roots can grow from the contact of the branches with the moist moss. We go from the largest cone, the smallest cone, to the largest cone. We have Norway spruce, Picea abies. This is a non-native spruce. Uh, one diagnostic feature is the size of the cone. You see the size of the cones here. Uh, also note the number of scales. Remember, we counted the number of scales in the eastern white pine cones. Here the cones have twice as many, just kind of round numbers, twice as many scales as the eastern white pine. Another interesting feature is that in silhouette, you can see the secondary branches. So I'm drawing a line along those secondary branches that extend away from the main stem. And then the tertiary branches droop relative to the main branches. That's a diagnostic feature, and you can see that in this picture on the lower left. So the primary branches, secondary branches droop. That's a feature, a diagnostic feature of Norway spruce. At one point back in the uh, 80s, there was discussion about how that was proof of acid rain because look at the way the branches droop. Well, that's that's the way this tree has always grown. So that that is not a diagnostic of anything other than the Norway spruce. Okay, so the best recognizable oak, and I didn't tell you this, um, you can maybe see it in the upper left hand corner, you can zoom in, I think you can do that with your with the buttons above, kind of in the upper right hand corner of the window. If you look at those, the buds on the ends of the twigs, the scales are reflexed where they roll backwards. So that's what um, that's what this means where I say reflexed terminal bud scales. It's introduced from Europe. It's uh, widely planted as a windbreak tree. It has decent lumber, although I'm not sure that it's much used for lumber in the Northeast. Uh, it may have opportunities as a biomass species just because of its ability to, to accumulate um, large volumes of wood. It will naturalize. Uh, in some areas, it uh, naturalizes more readily than in other areas. Okay, balsam fir, jumping to yet another new genus, Abies balsamia. Uh, we'll be talking um, 
I think this is our only ABs in the Northeast. I'm not drawing, I'm not coming up with any others. There's another spruce, white spruce we didn't talk about uh, in Carolina hemlock, which I've learned and been reminded of does not occur um, in the Northeast. So that was an error on my part. Uh, balsam fir, Abies balsamia, is a common shade tolerant species that grows in the Northeast. It also has two ranked foliage. Unlike the spruces, it lacks sterigmata, but rather where the needles attach to the twig, it has a circular disc. Uh, so that's diagnostic of the genus Abies. Um, the cones, you see the cones on the right are distinguished from the other conifers we've talked about because they are erect on the stem, so they stand upright. The other very important feature is that the cone scales are deciduous. So when the cone matures, the cone scales fall away. That aids in the dispersal of the seeds, and what you see left behind is a stalk. So you see a, a scaleless stalk. Uh, that, that persists on the twigs. On the stem, you will see blisters, resin blisters, um, and you can pop those resin blisters and you'll get a very sticky, as you can imagine from the word resin, a very sticky, clear liquid substance that comes out. It's wonderfully aromatic and has um, and has been used in the past as a glue for uh, cover slips to be attached to microscope slides. I suspect there's a synthetic product that's used now, but that was one of the historic uses of, of, the, of the pitch of balsam fir. It'll produce fir thickets. Uh, for those of you that like to hunt snowshoe hares, you'll recognize the, the uh, great virtue of this kind of an understory, spruce and fir understory, as cover for snowshoe, um, snowshoe rabbits or snowshoe hares. Uh, it will seed in profusely uh, amongst uh, dead standing conifers where you have spruce budworm has come through and killed the overstory. You may have a, a great proliferation of balsam fir in the understory. Uh, spruce and fir co-occur quite commonly. Fir tends to be fairly short-lived and uh, dies, grows fast and dies quickly. The red spruce tends to be longer-lived. So its best recognizable features include two-ranked foliage, it's very aromatic, the upright cones with the persistent stalk. Still another genus, Larix, eastern larch, also called tamarack, and some people I think will call it hackmatack, although I've heard that hackmatack applied to a couple of species. So eastern larch, tamarack, there's Western larch, there's European larch, and there's Japanese larch. We're just looking at Eastern larch or tamarack. Earlier I said that the pines were the only species that grew in a cluster. The foliage grew in a cluster. If you look at these needles, I would be hard pressed, especially the ones on the left, left hard pressed to convince you that that's not a cluster of needles. But in fact, it is not a cluster of needles. It only appears to be a cluster of needles. What has happened on that, so you see the main stem, the primary stem that runs from left to right in the picture, that's the main stem, and then you have a, another um, appendage that was um, uh, botanically was is formed to be able to create another stem, but that stem doesn't elongate. Okay. It forms what's called a short shoot or a spur shoot. So it has all of the capacity of a long shoot except that it doesn't elongate. And so it has, within that capacity for a long shoot, it has the foliage that you might find on a long shoot, but it's compressed onto a short shoot. And so if that long shoot was going to have, let's say, 20 needles on it, and those needles are compressed into a sixteenth of an inch stem, it's going to give the appearance of being a cluster of foliage. So you can call that clustered foliage or not. I know it's immaterial. Uh, the point is, though, botanically, it's, it's technically not a cluster. It looks like a cluster. I think it's kind of a cute-looking little cluster as far as clusters of needles go, uh, but it's diagnostic of the genus Larix, not the species, but the genus. So all of the other uh, species in the genus do the same thing. The cones are very small, um, or upright um, on the twig, as you see here. 
Uh, the unique feature of Larix, the genus, is that it's deciduous. So in the fall, the foliage turns a golden color. If you've, if you've read Aldo Leopold, Aldo says that's your clue, your cue, rather, your cue as to when you should go grouse hunting is when the larynx, the tamarack, turns its golden colored foliage. The, the fruit, the cone on the larch, eastern larch, is the smallest of within that genus. So that's a diagnostic feature, an important diagnostic feature. It's a very small cone. So here are some landscape shots showing the larynx in the fall as it turns colors. Best recognizable features, it's deciduous. Uh, it's joined as a deciduous conifer by Dawn Redwood. Um, oh, I'm drawing a blank on the genus there. Metrocydrus, right? Somebody can help me with that. And uh, bald cypress are also deciduous. Needles are clustered on the shoots there. I just told you they're clustered. I was trying to convince you they weren't. They're yellow and gold in color. Metasequoia, thank you, Robert. I was close. No, I wasn't close, but he's, Bob has it. Uh, curves from the maritime provinces all the way to Alaska, south into northern uh, New England and in the lake states. It's common on organic soils with black spruce. It's intolerant of shade, uh, and as I said earlier, will be found with black spruce at the northern limits. Okay, our final species that we're going to spend any time with is northern white cedar, Thuya occidentalis. So this is not only a new genus, it's a new family. Up till this point, we've been in the Pinaceae family. Here we're in the Cupress ACA family. The foliage of the cedar uh, is, there's a single look to this foliage, and it's all called um, scale-like. So it's like, 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 um, beads that have been pressed together and melted, and there's a keel or an edge to it, and they appear as scales along the twig. This time of the year, I'm seeing the foliage of northern white cedar has kind of a uh, non-vibrant look to it. In the summertime, it's, a, I think, a very, it's one of my favorite colors of greens. It's a very intense brilliant green color. Red spruce is probably my favorite color of green, but white cedar would be, northern white cedar would be a close second. The upper side is greener, the lower side tends to be more of whitish, again because of those stomata. The fruit just remind me, as you see the cones there on the on the lower right, look like little wooden roses, is the way I've always thought of those, and that's distinctive. The bark is very flaky and peely. Uh, it grows on uh, oftentimes on calcareous or very calcium rich soils and the crowns remember uh, red pine uh, tended to be kind of oval in shape as does northern white cedar grows in very dense can grow in very dense groves which will provide shade uh, so it's shady but it also provides thermal cover and uh, will be referred to as dark growth or swamp growth uh, and, and deer will often yard. Uh, this is a nutritious foliage. The other common name for Thuya occidentalis is arborvitae, tree of life. So, so to wrap this up, I wanted to show you another cedar, Juniperus virginiana, only because when you see the this written up in descriptions, you will see that eastern red cedar has two different types of foliage. It has mature scale-like foliage so that the picture on the left, I took the leftmost sprig and blew it up so you could see the scale-like foliage. And then on the lower portion of that stem is juvenile or all-like foliage. So this has two types of foliage. Um, and that's one way. So the other way that juniper is differentiated from thuya, thuya has a wooden cone-like structure. Uh, juniper has a berry. All right, so thuya, best recognizable features, flattened, scale-like foliage, aromatic, cone looks like a wooden rose. All right, so in closing, and thank you for your patience, I've run over. Um, but you all have been of good humor. Uh, Trade is fun. It's a great way to spend time. Uh, I'd encourage you to find the right field guide for you. Those of you in New York and the Northeast, um, if, if it's, um, and I'm 
biased. Um, Don Leopold, who's my major professor, uh, does fabulous work with tree identification as an exceptional photographer and dendrologist. So anything that he has produced, I would recommend. But for whatever it is, find the right guide for you. And with all of these hardwoods or conifers, make collections. And if you can't collect a specimen to take pictures, you can label those, and then you can also um, test yourself. Uh, use flashcards. Oftentimes, all five senses are helpful. Um, with conifers, it's going to be texture, so you feel it, um, smell it. Smell is very important. Visual, um, I don't usually do a lot of tasting on the conifers, and there's not a lot of sound on the conifers. So with that, I will stop, and if any of you have questions, that's great. I will call your attention. I think I have one more slide. Oh, that's the last slide. So we have a nice social media website. Let me type it in. So that's our social media site. And there's a place to post pictures. It's very easy to post pictures. So it's nice if you have an identification question, post it there. And there's about 600 people that are participants on that. So you have a good chance that somebody will know and be able to identify um, what you're looking at. Oh, thank you, Lou. Yes, and Lou is the one that brought to my attention the presence of Carolina pine and the Carolinas. Go figure. But Lou is right. There's, uh, there's the sound to the wind that's very soft as it goes through white pine. So... If there are questions, I'm happy to entertain them. So the last link is cornellforestconnect.ning.com. Uh, you actually, when you, I think when you close out of this, I have it set up so that you're going to be dumped onto that web page when you close out of this webinar. So that and that so that social media site, it's you know, Facebook is social media. I don't use Facebook, uh, but the social media is a nice place for people to come together when they want to have they have some shared interest. In this case it's rural woodlands. All right. Well thank you all. Have a great day. Winter has arrived in the Northeast. For those of you who live in the Northeast, you'll know that we're no longer under balmy conditions, but we're under crunchy, snowy conditions. So enjoy the snow, drive safely. And uh, next month, we're going to learn about um, how to buy and sell sap, which is a neat economic opportunity for many people. All right, enjoy your afternoon. Okay, Norm had a good question here. Continuing Ed credit, this was approved for one credit of Category 1 through the SAF. When you registered and obtained your registration access code, you were um, asked to click a link as to what type of continuing ed credit you wanted. If you wanted SAF credit or registered forester credit or master naturalist credit or whatever. So, um, so that's already done, and I will send that notice out usually within a week. Um, and I send it, I copy it to SAF, so if you're an SAF member, you basically don't need to take any additional action. Trees of New York. Uh, I don't know where you can buy trees. Of, so if it's a Don Leopold publication, I'd, go to, I'd start with Amazon and look up Don Leopold Syracuse. Uh, probably his books are there. Know Your Trees, uh, you can buy through Cornell Cooperative Extension. So, so Michael says, ISA certified credit. If you, I don't have an arrangement with the ISA, uh, but you're welcome. So if you requested some kind of, of continuing ed credit and um, send me a reminder, Here's my email. Uh, send me a reminder, and I can look and see if you 
requested any kind of continuing egg credit when you registered. If you did, you can take that email and you can send that to the ISA and you can handle um, uh, getting credit. But I, don't, I do not have a prearranged um, agreement with ISA. All right. Thank you all. Enjoy your afternoon.